Hey everyone, it's Rob Stanley with the Ecom Wiz Podcast, and my special guest today is Jason T. Smith, also known as Jason Thrifts, America's number one thrifter. Hey, Jason. What's happening, man? How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Now, I am just ecstatic that you're on my show. So oh, anybody, okay. uh, thank you. Thank you. So I'm actually a big fan of Jason's and the show that he was on, and we will definitely talk about that a little bit more. But today we're going to cover something that I don't usually have on the podcast because we usually cover a lot more of the Amazon type world stuff. But we're going to talk a bit about how to be profitable selling CDs, records, and thrift items. And the reason we're covering that is because a lot of Amazon sellers or pe you know, people just sell online in general, start off with like a retail arbitrage or they go to thrift stores and buy stuff and sell on eBay. I mean, every guest I've had on here pretty much has started on eBay. But uh, I want to start off with a quick question and get going. Sure. So when you walk into a thrift store and you see an item, how do you know you're going to make a profit on it? What kind of knowledge do you have or background to be able to walk in there and know certain items will sell and certain ones won't? Well, I've been uh, thrifting my entire life. Mom and grandma took me to my first flea market when I was six. And I didn't buy anything then. But at 10, my mom took me to the neighboring town's uh, community garage sale for the whole town. It was in front of the high school. And I, at 10, I already had two jobs. So I had 40 bucks in my pocket. It was 1981. It's a lot of money for a 10-year-old back then. And I realized that day I could buy four times as many used toys as new toys. And I'm like, I'd rather have more stuff than new stuff. So I, I was hooked from that moment on. So a lot of things I gravitate towards, I've always purchased. I've always collected. I've always flipped and sold. So I have a insane working knowledge, especially when it comes to music. Music is one of the biggest things I sell. And, and people are just like, man, what's in your brain is insane. So a lot of that I know. But then the rest, as long as you have a smartphone, you can research anything on the fly. And then when you hit those buildings that doesn't have any internet connectivity, you have to rely on your spidey sense, your sixth sense, your women's intuition, whatever it is that you're like, okay, I've been doing this long enough to know this looks like a good brand or this looks so weird that it's got to be worth money or man, ugly sells. That's super duper ugly. So I'm going to go with it, but I wouldn't risk big money. I wouldn't risk a hundred dollars on something that I just was like, looks good. Uh, but you know, there's a couple bucks. Uh, someone the other day was asking for help on something and I was helping them, but I'm like, you know, we always, always try and teach people to research for themselves. The whole give a man a fish thing, you know? And I finally said, wait, how much is this? And she's like, 99 cents, B buy it. It's 99 <laughs> cents. Where is the risk? Yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know, the, the smartphone makes it so easy that anyone can do this. If you have a smartphone and you can read, you can pretty much buy things to resell, whether it be new uh, on clearance end camps at Walmart or sitting in the rack at a thrift store. It's pretty easy yeah. with, some, yeah, with some guidance. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, odds are, though, that you probably have a little more expertise in certain categories. You're talking about music. So when you go into the thrift store, uh, are you kind of, you first thing you do is kind of go over to the music area. And then what other categories do you kind of feel you're strong at that are your next that you look at? I would say uh, in the thrift store, music for sure. <clears throat> and that includes cassettes, CDs, and records. Uh, and then sometimes you look out and see eight tracks or reel to reels. Uh, I'm really good at uh, Hawaiian shirts and men's t-shirts and jeans. So I definitely spend a lot of time in those areas. And I love, love, love the glass counter. Every thrift store has a glass counter, a glass display case where their good stuff is. And so it's always a fun game where, is it really good stuff? Is it amazing? Do they put it back there because they don't know what it is. So that is like my challenge. So I, I conquer the things that I know without even blinking. And then I'm like, all right, let's go pick out that one item out of the uh, glass display case that no one else is paying attention to and I'll make money on it. Yeah, so we'll, we'll do a little test of my knowledge and see if I remember correctly from the days of watching your show. It seemed like, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, and you already mentioned this, like I wouldn't say ugly things, unusual, unusual items us can usually do better. Now, obviously we have phones where we can look things up now. Um, but and I think there was another thing you guys mentioned on the show and, and correct me again if I'm wrong, but uh, bigger sizes when it comes to clothes. Was that oh, right? Yeah. Bigger sizes do better. So see, yeah. I was paying attention. Oh, yeah. Very, very good. Yeah. You know, because you can walk into any store that sells clothing, whether it be high end 
or or low end Walmart or um, I'm trying to think of higher a Jose Bank suit, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter. But you can walk in as a normal sized man, and I'm not a normal sized man, but as a normal sized man, you can walk in and get a suit or a t shirt or a pair of jeans anywhere. But when you get to be six five, six eight, seven foot, 200 pounds, 300 pounds, 500 pounds, your options start to dwindle. And luckily, luckily, companies have made stylish clothing for big men and women in the last, I would say, 10 years. When I was growing up uh, as a big kid and then as a big adult, most big size clothing was boring and drab. Like they felt anybody big wanted to disappear. Mm. And so there was never like brands and, and then, uh, you know, good brands, like fashionable brands. And then boom, something happened where they're like, oh, big people want to be fashionable too. But still, even with that, the options to find a 4XL shirt is so few compared to a large so yeah, you have a, a smaller pool. And so when someone who needs a four or five, like I just picked up an eight XL shirt, someone who needs that shirt, he don't have a lot of options. So, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, I don't, I'm not having to fight with everyone else who's selling large t-shirts, you know? Yeah. I, unfortunately I'm only five, six, so I don't really have that issue, but I completely understand. And it was more about paying attention to the show. Like I was watching the show to learn because I was, I, was, I, was, I was out there thrifting and garage selling and doing all that stuff. I mean, heck, my business, the business and company I ran for 20 years was started off of a box of parts I bought for $100 at a computer swap meet. And we ended up running that company for millions of dollars. So definitely, nice. definitely uh, it, it can be done. Uh, just to kind of go back to tools, we have the phone in front of us. Now, as far as using that phone, are you just looking stuff up on eBay to check prices or do you have actual like uh, software or tools that you're using on the phone to check stuff? So I pay for no software. So people okay. are always shocked by this because there's, there is great software. I'm not uh, dissing it. I'm not uh, speaking of anything specific, but I have never felt the need to pay for anything because with the ability to scan on both Amazon and eBay, and I also use an app uh, called Discogs, I, I can pretty much find anything I need, uh, within reason enough to make that quick educated guess i don't need to pay for a monthly service scan it see my profit margins i've been selling online for over 20 years i know my margins i don't need to i don't need to have an app tell me my margins i can read and i know how to read now it's not something that you just know just because yeah. you pick up a phone tomorrow if you're new to this and you picked up a phone tomorrow and scan something there's more than just scanning you have to be able to read and understand what you're seeing but once you do you're good plus the people who use apps, they can only scan barcodes. If you uh, use the Amazon app, you can scan the front of things that don't have barcodes. Yeah, absolutely. And I sure. love I love following those sellers who are scanning all the books where they're, they got their phone on their wrist and they're scanning their little thing, but they have to skip every single book that doesn't have a barcode. And I love to sit behind them and, and uh, pick up a book and go <laughs> and put it in my cart. Now, yep. sometimes I'm just messing with them, but sometimes I'm finding good stuff right behind them because they couldn't scan it. Yeah. It, it's good to try to have like a good knowledge, especially a, like books, right? That's a category. Like if you're going to be in the a book category, you should have a knowledge that if you look some, look at something, even if it's not scannable, you kind of know, and then you yep. can look at the price and see, is it worth the risk or not? So I, I agree with you on that. So besides thrift stores, I, and I know this is probably kind of a dumb question, but where else do you, th I mean, garage sales, tell us everywhere you kind of go and, and, and look for stuff. Yeah. So I would say thrift stores is number one. Um, I love estate sales. They've been a little wonky this year because of COVID. Uh, you know, they're only letting so many people in. And then of course, you've got to try and stay away from each other once you're in, which is a little tricky when we're all in a closet trying to look at, you know, so, uh, but I love, love, love estate sales. Uh, garage sales are, I love the garage sales, but a garage sales in Las Vegas, I don't love. And so I do, I'll, I'll hit them, but like back home, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, back home, those garage sales are always amazing. And here, and here's what happens here. Uh, it's a 24 hour town. So pre COVID people would say, you know, they get their ad on Craigslist, having a garage sale at 8am. They must have party the night before because me and 10 other people show up at the opening and the garage isn't even open. There's no one there. I'm like, they partied all night and forgot to forgot they're having a garage sale. And that has happened so many times. I just quit going to garage sales in this town. And I love flea markets, 
but we don't have any in Las Vegas. So I have to travel for those too. I love living in Vegas, but the downfall is the garage sales aren't the greatest and we have no flea markets. And I like shop, yeah. I, I like shop uh, thrifting online. Every time I am about to teach a webinar on this or that, I'm like, all right, I, I'm gonna talk about this website. Let me see if I can find something in 10 minutes. That's kind of my little goal. And the other day I was teaching about Macari and within 10 minutes, I found two great things to flip. I mean, mm. so cheap. I'm like, why are people wasting their time? But I'm glad they were because it's be good for me. Yeah. A, a, a person sold 41 soul and funk CDs for $25 with free shipping. Oh, geez. And they were all good stuff. There's a couple duds, but I said, look, at the minimum, I could take this $25 investment walk into a record store to trade them in. And at the minimum, they would give me 50 bucks. I would double my money with no work. Yeah. Now, if I take the time to sell them piece by piece online, I'll probably triple quadruple my money. But sometimes I look at people and go, why are you wasting, why are you wasting your energy? Yeah, exactly. What about, what about also like the closeout sections of say like a Walmart or a Target? I've found good deals in those. I have found good deals, but I, you know, I just don't spend a lot of time in retail stores. So sure. I know, I know a lot of people who sell on Amazon, that's kind of where they get their start. And when I'm in a store that does have a closeout end cap, I'll absolutely look it up, scan it, check out what's there. But man, I just don't find myself in retail all that often anymore. You know, uh, uh, luckily I have an awesome wife who uh, does the running around uh, for us and we order a lot of stuff online. So it's funny, I used to love, man, I was a guy who went to the mall all the time. I used to love doing all that. And I'm just like, yeah, retail just ain't my dig gig anymore. I don't like retail anymore. And, and not that I don't mind buying things at retail. Like if I need a new phone, I'm going to the Apple store. That's retail. Yeah. But for just going out on a general day to look for things, yeah, it's always gonna be secondhand goods for me. Yeah, I, I've, never bought a, I've never bought a brand new car for myself ever. My wife, I've bought a brand new car for, but I've never owned a brand new car myself. So yeah, I, I'm always looking for good You've deals. You've never experienced things. a new car smell on your own. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, it just something I, I've just always, I, it's because I'm frugal. I, I'd rather get a car that's a year or two old, has some miles on it and get it for a good deal uh, than you know, go in there and buy it brand new. And I don't know, maybe that'll change at some point. I'm getting older, so we'll see. Now, other than, <laughs> we'll move off of me, <laughs> let's see. So other than uh, eBay and Amazon, what other marketplaces do you sell on? Uh, Macari, you mentioned, uh, do you yes, sell I on sell there also? It. Yeah, so Macari, Depop, Etsy, Poshmark, Facebook Marketplace, yep. Discogs. What about like Overstock? Or no, I'm sorry, not Overstock. Um, uh, what about like uh, Craigslist? You ever sell stuff local? That's you know, I, I haven't done anything on Craigslist. However, we are having a garage sale next weekend. So I'll probably put an ad up. But yeah, I haven't done any listing on Craigslist in a long time. Craigslist is kind of getting left in the dust. They were way too late to the game to get an app. And I'm like, they couldn't They couldn't see the writing on the wall. Yeah, I mean, people still use it and you should. But I, I, I'm always find myself on offer up. Oh, I sell an offer up too. Yep. Me oh, too. and Bonanza. I keep <laughs> the all places I sell on. And Bonanza and Together. So quite a few websites. You ever uh, tried Nextdoor by any chance? You know, I don't think I've ever sold anything on Nextdoor. I look around on Nextdoor for stuff, but I don't think I've ever listed anything. But we have two garages we need to clean out and sort out. So I think there's going to be a lot of local apps that I'll be using like Nextdoor, OfferUp, exactly. Facebook Marketplace, and Craigslist just to get rid of some of the stuff that I don't feel like, you know, shipping and dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I find is, is that I, heavier items are better to sell on some of the local apps. Let's say uh, I get, I was telling Jason uh, before we started. So a couple weeks ago I was on uh, next door, somebody put up a free uh, kids golf cart. Now golf is kind of hot right now because it's one of the only sports that was, is open. I mean, there's other now opening up, but uh, it's pretty hot where I live in my area. We have several golf courses. I went and picked it up for free on the weekend I just sold it yesterday for $25. I got it for free, sold it for 25. That's a hundred thousand, you know, thousand percent increase in my margin <laughs> right there. I mean, those are the margins we look for, right? So, oh, yeah. so uh, how, how about, uh, how has the increase in the shipping charges lately uh, kind of hindered your online selling or being able to ship stuff? Uh, it hasn't, thanks to COVID. Every month for me since March has been Christmas. Every yeah. single month has been December for me. I have just crushed I, we're finished up September and I have uh, almost tripled my sales since last September. So it's amazing. And even my, my bookkeeper was like, Whoa. So it, 
when your bookkeeper goes, whoa, in a good way, you're like, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Not like, whoa, you've got to work on. Yeah, she was like, uh, yeah, you're having a killer year. I'm like, I know, I know. I got That's no complaints. Crazy. You know, COVID hurt a lot of businesses, going to put a lot of our friends out of business, a lot of companies we like out of business. But the silver lining was for resellers, at least for me, people stayed home and bought stuff and they continue to buy stuff and it never stops. Yeah. And I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that some of those people will pivot, right? Like pivot either into starting their own business or running their own company or maybe doing what Jason's doing and do some thrifting or some reselling. Uh, definitely. That's why we're here to kind of provide some information to help everybody out. So uh, my next question for you is uh, tell me about the most profitable item that you've purchased when either thrifting, garage selling, or whatever. Do you, you know, pick one there. I'm sure there's been a few. Yeah, there's tons. Uh, probably one of my favorites uh, because of like the, the punchline of the story. Okay. Uh, I bought a CD at a record store in Santa Monica, uh, right on Wilshire Boulevard. This was back in the early 2000s. And I knew it was a special edition of the Woodstock soundtrack, but the 18 mm -hmm. uh, year olds who ran the store didn't notice it was a special edition, so they priced it at 14 bucks. thought it was the regular edition. So I quickly scooped it up. This was probably about 2002. I threw it on eBay at auction, and two dudes just duked it out for a week, wow. and the winner uh, paid me $507. Wow. And the, the punchline is when I went to ship it, he lived two miles from the store I paid 14 bucks at. Dang, that's crazy. Yep. That's crazy. So that's a pretty good return, fourteen dollars into five hundred and seven. I'm I mean, when it comes to music, I was a little bit shocked. So I'll give you a great example. So I not too long ago, a couple of years ago, I was like, you know, I I, I loved the uh, the C D for the Chronic, right? The original Dr. Dre's yeah, yeah. The Chronic. Try to go find the original C D to the Chronic. I'm thinking, God, people probably threw those everywhere. They're probably everywhere. You can find them cheap. They're like two to four hundred dollars for the original Chronic CD, and I was like, "That's crazy!" So of course, anytime I go into thrift stores, I'm looking for that. Oh yeah, I'm I'm looking for any of like the original stuff. I'm looking for the original Beastie Boys license the ill because that's expensive. Also, that's a collector's well, item. Well, things happen. Things happen where um, things change. So mm -hmm. along the same lines as the Chronic, Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style mm -hmm. has a song that got removed. And, and, and usually I'm like a nerd for this knowledge. I don't know why it got removed because usually I can tell you like this got removed because of this. Uh, but the song got removed. So when you find the, the Doggy Style with G's up on it, uh, that's worth a lot of money because from that point, once they removed it, it's never come back. Yeah. And um, same with Slipknot. I'm a huge Slipknot fan. And their first major label release they wrote two songs based on a short story they read online and they were led to believe they were okay to write two songs about it. So the album comes out and the author goes, what the hell? <laughs> and so they had to pull it. And so they pulled it right away. So those that got out and got sold, and I do find them usually about three or four times a year, uh, makes that worth about 35, 40, 50 bucks because those yeah. two songs. So long, as soon as you know those two songs, which are Purity and Frail Limb Nursery, you see that in the back of the Slipknot debut? You got 50 bucks right there. Wow. I mean, how, how much of a comeback have record albums made? I mean, my daughter, uh, just a couple of years ago, she wanted a record player. And we went out and, nice. you know, luckily they've got the ones now that have the little built-in speakers because she didn't have a lot of room in her dorm. So, but, and then she started buying all these current artist albums. Now, but I mean, how crazy is the price? It's like 35 to $75 for a record album for a new release of like a new band. But I mean, how big is the, has the explosion been in uh, records coming back? So records are out, sell, uh, just started out selling CDs for the first time since 1986. I know it's almost two to one right now. I was, cause I, I'm teaching a, a, rec, uh, a record flipping record selling class coming up in about a week. And so anytime I'm teaching the class, I'm like, all right, let me get some nuggets, some knowledge. And I was just looking around, I'm like, oh my God, it just, I mean, talk about timing. I'm starting to put together my advertising materials for my free class. And just then the article comes out, records are outselling CDs for the first time since 1986. Wow. I'm like, get out of here. But it's so crazy. A friend of mine uh, last night said, hey, I, I need to sell some stuff in my house. And she goes, any interest in buying my record collection? So she is about 30 years old. I go, 
she goes, I got a video. And so she just got a video of her flipping them down. So send ah. it to me. And I know she's about 30, like 30, 32. I go, how old are you again? I didn't really need the answer because I know it. I go, you have the record collection of a 65 year old. This is crazy. <laughs> you know, it was, it was uh, Bob Marley and Led Zeppelin and the oh. Eagles. And I'm like, you're 32 or whatever. I'm like, uh, great collection, but most yeah. things I had, she had Prince and Michael Jackson and uh, the Doors. I'm like, so awesome. But yeah, you know, the funny thing is, if you, if you look over this shoulder right here behind my spinning records, I yeah. put together an old school stereo. It's only, oh, got, go. it's only got a record player, a cassette, and an A-track, no CD. Nice. And I don't think ever in my life I had ever done this. But once I hooked it up, I listened to a record, and then I listened to a cassette, and then I listened to an A-track. So I've never listened to those three in a row. Wow. And I, I was never that guy that said, oh, vinyl sounds so much better. I didn't really care. But then I listened to it compared to other things. I'm like, oh, it took me to almost 50, but I get it now. It sounds so amazing. So I've been on a record buying binge for my personal stuff. Besides the stuff I find to resell, I've been buying a ton of records for my own collection. So here's a tip for everybody. If you're ever in Arizona, specifically Tempe, Arizona, which is right across, uh, and you're right across the street from Arizona State. There's a hotel or a motel called the Moxie. Stay at the Moxie. Every room has a record player and they have a record oh, cool. collection. And they give you, I think they give you a couple records. So we stayed there several times because my daughter's at Arizona State. And we walked in there, they had Van Halen sitting there. They had Led Zeppelin sitting there. Uh, I think even Bob Bar Marley was there. So we literally grabbed him and started throwing them on him. We were just like freaking, my wife and I were freaking out because it was just so fun to, to listen to the old records, right? Get the needle on there and had to use a little lever to pull the needle up and everything. Yep. It was it was hilarious. I mean, it, it brought back a lot of memories. Okay. Anyway, so moving on. Sorry. All right. Have you ever tried retail arbitrage or uh, storage auctions? So I did storage auctions a little bit and then all the shows happened mm -hmm. uh, and they ruined it. Um, not the, the price went up a little bit and that's fine. Things like that happen. But the problem with storage lockers, when all the shows became popular, everyone gets like 30 seconds to 60 seconds to stand there and gaze into the storage locker. Well, back before those shows, it was me and the seven, same 11 other dudes. So it was always 12 of us. And then those shows started and I went to, I wasn't even thinking of this. I went to the, my next storage locker auction and there was 97 people. Whew. So now when you take 97 people times 60 seconds, Holy crap, a locker that used to take a total of five minutes is now taking an hour and a half. And then all these people don't know what they're doing. So they would bid and then, and then you'd end up winning, but you're like, oh, I just got bid up by this idiot who didn't want it anyway. They don't know what they're doing. So I just kind of walked away from that. And retail arbitrage, I do it, uh, I do it to a degree, but I do it a little differently. I, uh, I quite enjoy going to tiki bars around the country and I've learned the fine art of drinking a cocktail that comes in a collectible mug and then selling the mug and making profit on the mug. So that means not only was my was there money in my pocket, my drink was free. Absolutely. And so I'll buy multiple. So I don't go into Walmart and clear them out, but I do go places like uh, uh, Disneyland, Downtown Disney, Disney World, places yeah. where things can only be purchased there. And then I just sell them online. So I do retail arbitrage, but I call it specialty retail arbitrage. I'm only in specific places that have like collectibles. That's awesome. Yeah, and I, I've done something similar to that. We, my wife and I used to collect the Hard Rock menus. And uh, we actually kept, we collected them to keep them. But I, knowing what I know now, I should have got extra ones because they, they oh, sell yeah. like crazy. So, uh, so if you don't know, and, and you guys are listening to the podcast this far in, hopefully, <laughs> uh, Jason had, was on a show. It's called Thrift Hunters. It was on Spike TV. It was approximately, I think, 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yep. I had a couple couple seasons that yep. you're on there with uh, Brian Goodman, if, uh, if I got that right. And why don't you tell us, tell us how did you end up on this TV show on Spike TV for two seasons? So uh, Brian and I were uh, buddies for a couple of years and we were starting to uh, do classes. Oh, be quiet, Siri. We were starting <laughs> to do classes and uh, some YouTube videos. And this was way back like, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, and Facebook groups. And my, uh, my uncle had passed, who was also my godfather. So I was home for his funeral. And Brian called me and said, hey, a production company called us and said they want to make a TV show about us. Now, I thought he was kidding. I thought it was just some friend pulling our leg. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm home uh, taking care of some funeral stuff. 
I'll be back in a week. And if it's real, we'll talk to him. And it was real because we ended up on TV. We had two seasons. And uh, we were bummed we getting picked up for a third because, A, our show was uh, very uh, – we kept the cost very low, so mm-hmm. it was easy to produce and easy for a, a television uh, network to make money off of. Plus, we were in 47 countries around the world. So we were on Discovery in some countries. We were on uh, A&E in some countries, a thing called Travel and Escape in Canada. And we realize now that Spike was changing over to Paramount back then. And mm-hmm. so what they were doing was they got rid of all the small shows. I think they only brought two no, they brought three shows over for the changeover. So they got rid of the rest of us. So unfortunately, it was our circumstances that, you know, it wasn't our ratings. Our, our first season, we averaged about a million a, a view. But, uh, you know, it wasn't meant to be. I, so. I think they, they messed up because I think it was not short. It was not too long after they canceled your guys' show that really the whole online selling thing blew up even bigger. Yeah. And, and I, I, I mean, there's shows out there kind of similar to what you guys did. Uh, back then that are doing great. I mean, the storage auction stuff, it, that's just another sort of offshoot of going and buying something and reselling it online. And that kind of took off right after you guys kind of ended. So that's kind of a bummer they didn't hold on a little longer. But um, but I'll tell you this though, the network, you know, remember back when Elvis came out and then we found out Colonel Tom Parker was taking like more than half his money. Yeah. Well, nothing's changed. The network lied to us constantly. Like nothing ever changes. So if you want to be on TV and get a little bit of fame, here's what you're going to deal with. You, everything, every promise you were given, it never comes true. So if you can live with that, great. If, if it's going to eat you up, don't do it. Make sure you get it in writing, right? There's some oh, legal Even advice. in writing. I, plus, we had meetings with executives, and they're like, we're going to do this and this and this, and you're going to blow up. And they didn't do any of it. Oh, geez. And then they were mad at that, that we didn't have bigger ratings. I'm like, you're not showing repeats. You're not running uh, marathons like you said you would. Like everything you said you would, which you have to do with new shows, you didn't do any of it. So we're getting a million viewers a week based on just us. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it was a great show. But what, what was your – hopefully it's not a bad experience. What was your most memorable moment on the show? Oh, wow. Um, you know, the one thing I go back to uh, is – and it wasn't really that big on the show, but there was an estate sale company in Portland, Oregon, that was so nice. Uh, the, most of the estate sale companies in Vegas aren't so nice. And there are some underhanded uh, estate sale companies in this town. Like, if I show up and not realize what estate sale I'm at and I see them, I'm like, I'm out. See you later. Yeah. Like, they'll change the prices while you're standing in front of you. Oh, so they'll put geez. a price up on the wall and they'll try and change it in front of you. I'm like, no, and I, I got smart. Here's the picture of your sign. Yeah. So this this uh, it was a husband and wife team. Them and their entire staff were so nice, and we found lots of good stuff to resell. It was a cool house, and it was just this nice day in Portland. The sun was out. The birds were chirping. It was just like that that perfect moment of, oh, because I would have loved the estate sale had we not been filming the show. But filming the show plus filming the show, no matter where we were in line, we always got to go in first. So that oh, was yeah. the best. That was best. <laughs> what about getting all the products back to uh, back to your house? Yeah, stuff? that was a lot of shipping. That was put our shipping skills to the test because on the ones we could drove like uh, drive like we did Phoenix and two uh, Phoenix for uh, a couple episodes, we just drove back to Vegas. But when yeah. we were in Boston and Portland, yeah, there was always like two nights where it was uh, Brian and I and uh, our assistant on the road that we we're just packing and shipping at the FedEx store and. Yeah, it, that was a lot of work. We had a real small crew, so it wasn't like I was like, okay, peon, take care of this, because, you know, I was the peon. Yeah. <laughs> Even though the show was about me, it was, all, it was all a lot of work. And let me tell you, making TV is not fun nor glamorous, because we had a lot of friends film with us. At the end of their, like, little three-hour window, they're like, oh, this stinks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I go, you thought it was going to be so much more fun, didn't you? I'm like, yeah, I go, you did it for three hours. Every episode, it was 50 hours of filming and travel per episode. Dang. And in, in an episode, it's only 18 minutes of content. Yeah. Yeah, because it was only a half-hour show, which you, yeah. you got commercials and everything in there. What look, about, it, ain't, uh, it ain't digging ditches and laying brick. So <laughs> I'm not saying there are not hard jobs out there, but I'm telling you what you think it is and the reality, it's, it's a lot of this. 
Oh, are we ready now? Because it's, you know, <laughs> if the Harley's driving by, you can't film. If the plane's flying by, you can't film. If a little kid walks in front of you, you can't film. So it's just constantly, you're waiting all day long. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. So just to line this question up a little bit. So I, I remember on the show, a lot of times, uh, let's say you go to a thrift shop or somewhere and you collect a bunch of items, you go check out, let's say you got $47 worth of stuff. And they would always show... Uh, they would always ask you or show, hey, I project I'm going to make $400 on all these items. How realistic were those projections? Did they ask you for those? Did they want yeah. you to inflate it? Okay, so you, you were the ones giving the actual like estimate on what you thought you'd make. Yeah, the... Uh... Mm, dang, I, I thought it was handy. I still have my books. So oh, I, okay. kept, I kept a three ring binder with both seasons and every episode because I also very much cared about how good are my projections. Yeah. And so I had a book of, uh, with everything that we bought and what, I, what we paid for, what I said the projections were for, the, for that store, and then what it sold for. And uh, it never came in under, never came in under, wow. probably came in accurate about 40% of the time and about 60% of the time I was, uh, it came in way over. So yeah, so yeah that, was all, that was all us figuring it out and you know, looking, using what's in our brain what we sold in the past, you know, some things went way higher than we expected. And then some things were like, well, that didn't go so well. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the, that's the life of a reseller. You think, man, this is a home run. I bought a thousand of these widgets and they're going to make me a lot of money. And you're like, I barely got my money back. And then you buy some stupid, ugly thing. And you're like, this is worth $10,000. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's, that's the truth. So, uh, one of the things that's been discussed online uh, a lot with, let's say, uh, the auction, storage auction type stuff, right? Uh, they talk a lot about like uh, planting of items and, uh, and, and you know something's going on because if you're like me and you watch the show, the storage shows, and I'm not going to use any names, but storage shows, when they open it up and you see all the names of the boxes have been blacked out or taped over, somebody's already been in there. Oh, so. Yes. So I have to ask, uh, was there ever any point that you felt like, hey, maybe somebody planted an item uh, for you guys to find and buy? Or was there anything like that going on when you were on the show? Well, no, because our crew had never thrifted in, our, in their lives. So they wouldn't even know, you know, that was a thing. They wouldn't even know what to do. The first day we filmed episode one, we had obviously never filmed TV and they had never thrifted, none of them. And so the first like hours, two hours, we're all just kind of, you know, we had an idea and a thought, but still they're trying to figure out the angles. Plus our entire crew is shorter than us. So that was a little tricky. And uh, we were trying to figure out how to not be like, look in the camera and, you know, do that, do the right, the right things. Thrift stores, garage sales and flea markets, they would just kind of follow us uh, almost like cops, like right over the shoulder, here we go. Sure. And teach stores, we did take the time to figure out what booths we wanted to shop in. So that's really the only prep we took mm -hmm. because it would be a waste of time and film to walk into a booth that's selling doilies and quilts. That's just not our thing. And so when we go into a, an antique mall, we would spend about an hour looking around. Okay, I like these 12 booths. And then we would then they would come in and film us like those 12 were kind of on the way, skipping all the ones where they were selling like garden gnomes. Yeah. Just not my thing. And so that would have been a waste of time. But that was really about the only prep. I mean, of course, every store knew we were coming. This is where people just, conspiracy theories online are so nutty. Well, that's not true. They knew you we were coming. Of course, it's not guerrilla filming. Like we have to let a store know we're coming. Plus they got to say, yes, I would like to be on TV. Yep. They but probably have to sign that, a release. <laughs> yeah, but thrift stores weren't pausing in their day to like, what good stuff can we put out? Cause they didn't need to, I can find good stuff worth money in any thrift store, any flea market, any garage sale and any antique mall. I just got to take the time to look for it, but it's always there. It's yeah. never not there. We only left one thing and, and we played it the way it worked out. We went to Rhode Island's largest garage sale. Okay. And when we walked in, it's like the needle skipped off the record to go back to records. It was so tiny. It oh. was inside a hall with like, 10 tables and there was hardly anything there. And I looked at the camera and Brian said, if this is the largest garage sale, I would hate to see the smallest. Yeah. So we were supposed to film for four hours. There was so little stuff. We were done in 27 minutes. Oh. So we, we did do some on the fly. We're like, all right, we're gonna start driving and look for garage sale signs. Found the greatest garage sale. So we didn't even know we were going there. Hey, there's good stuff here. Hey, you guys wanna be on TV? Sure, boom, we're on it. 
And so that was the only time where it was just like, uh oh, what do we do now? We need to fill four hours of filming, and we were there for 27 minutes. That's great. That's great. So if somebody wanted to start, say, thrifting or buying garage sales and selling online, what kind of advice would you give them? I know that's kind of a long one, but just kind of like basic advice. So if you've never, ever thrifted before, what I want you to do is I want you to go to a thrift store and go to your size of clothing. So whatever size you wear, go into the jeans section, go into the dress shirt section. If you're a woman, go into the dress section, go into the bra section and pick out things that you think just based on your eyes that look fun or expensive or good to flip. And then if they don't work out, the worst you have is some extra clothes in your wardrobe. So really no harm, no foul. You know, don't, don't go as a large uh, size person, I mean a size large person and buy 8XL and hope. That you gotta have some knowledge. But go in your size clothing, and then there's no just there's no risk to you at all. And then secondly, if you collect something, if you know something well, if you're a gamer, if you collect uh, tiki mugs, if you collect a Spice Girls memorabilia, go find that section. And then that way too, because you've got working knowledge of something very. We all love or collect something, so go to that section because you'll see like, oh, I know that's worth a lot of money. You know, don't just like, I'm going to learn art as day one. No, that just doesn't work that way. But start slow. Go home, list that pair of jeans you found in your size and try and get a couple bucks for it and get your feet wet. Screw up on a pair of jeans because it, it's not going to break in transit. It won't break when you ship it. If it doesn't sell, you can wear them. You know, minimize your risk to start. But then start expanding. Start learning more things. Look, I used to go to thrift stores and only look for the things I liked. And then one day I'm like, wait a minute, I'm in this giant thrift store and I only looked at like three sections. I should go find some other stuff. And you know, I didn't start out selling purses and dresses and large bras, but I do now. I don't carry a purse. I, I was about to say I don't wear a dress, but I do on occasion. Uh, I definitely don't wear a bra, but I sell them because I've learned. I've learned from friends, I've learned from YouTube, I've learned from the people in my Facebook groups and uh, you keep expanding your knowledge. Yeah. That's, that's great. I, I remember one other thing from the show that I have to throw in there. I think you guys were possibly in like Palm Springs, Palm Desert area. Mm -hmm. You're at a thrift store and it, there was a lady there who I guess is also a thrifter. I can't remember her name off the top of my head. Lynn Drolly, the queen of auctions. Yes. And I remember either her or yourself or, uh, or Brian, you were looking at these uh, patterns and I think they were for, uh, not for sewing, but I think it was for needle stitching or something like that. Yeah. And she picked up these patterns and there was a whole bunch of them there. And she showed how much she made on those things. And it was, I think she bought them for a few dollars each and they were selling for like 30 to $45 each. And I was just like, wow. So every time I go into any thrift store, savers or anything, I'm always looking for this. So that's so funny. I have a, a more good, so I've, I've sold whole, I found a whole box of remotes that I probably made over a thousand dollars on. I spent a hundred dollars nice. on them. I mean, cause everybody loses their remotes, right? I mean, so I've definitely lived your role, just probably not the extent that you have, but uh, <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. So I, I want to go into some more of your background and, and how you got started. But before I do, if you weren't thrifting, if thrifting wasn't your life, what do you think your career would be or what would you be doing? Well, I worked in a lot of record stores, and so I'm such a music nerd. I would probably be doing something like that. Uh, my last record store job was the night manager at Tower Records on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. Oh, so wow. this was back in the early 2000s. So way pre-internet and way pre-streaming and downloading. And so if you wanted to buy music, no matter who you were, you had to come into Tower. So every night I was helping a different celebrity, and it was a ton of fun. Other than my wife and I, I worked second shift. She worked first shift. So we never, ever saw each other, really. And yeah. we like each other. And so that's the only thing that bummed me about that job. But I loved working for record stores. And so if I wasn't a thrifter, I'd, stop, I'd probably still be doing that in some capacity. That's awesome. Anybody listening, you've got to go look that up. That Tower Records on Sunset, uh, it's not there anymore, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it's but still there. And is they, it still there? So they redid the facade for a movie. And, uh, and, it, and it turned into like a carpet store or something. And that store went out and they left the facade. So it still looks like Tower right now. And I think they rent it out for events inside now. Oh, awesome. Well, a lot of movies were shot in front of that. It's world famous, the picture of the uh, Tower Records on Sunset Boulevard. He's talking yep. about that he worked at. 
uh, go just Google it, everybody. I mean, you'll, you'll find it. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, I remember, oh, probably in the uh, early 90s when I went down to LA, drove down there to go to Disneyland or something, went by there and took a picture in front of it. I don't know if I necessarily went in there, but we definitely got a picture in front of it. It was just one of those iconic California sort of symbols that you have to go by back, oh, in, yeah, the, absolutely. back in the era there. So how long, look, tell us a little bit more about you. Like how long have you been thrifting and what kind of got you started into it? Go take us back a bit. Yeah. So as I said, uh, that, that community sale was 1981. Yeah. And I think Empire was out. I don't remember when Empire Strikes came out exactly, but Star Wars had obviously been out. And yeah. so I had this 40 bucks in my pocket. I had a little red wagon and I, and I loved, I loved reading. I loved reading books. I loved playing games. I loved Star Wars. And so with that 40 bucks, I bought so much stuff. Now I didn't, you know, I didn't sell it back then, but I was like, Ooh, I was hooked. And I was such a nerd for garage sales. And back when we were kids, you and I, it wasn't cool to say you went to garage sales and you thrifted. That wasn't a cool thing. So you kind of kept that quiet. So when I took my driving course, I'm, I bet you I'm the only person that's ever done this. When I took my, I had to take four, you know, back then we took four days, two hours each day. Yeah. I was driving when I was 12. I grew up in the country. I was driving when I was 12. So when I got my first day of driving class, the guy's like, you know how to drive. I go, uh-huh. And so we went through the, 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 the BS regular stuff. So on the fourth last day, he goes, look, you don't need to learn anything. What do you want to do? I go, ooh, garage sale. So my last day of driving lessons was all garage selling, me and the instructor. So we garage sale the whole time. Oh, so that's, that, awesome. that's how much of a nerd I was for it. And I didn't, you know, I didn't see it as a, a means to an end or a job until I lost a job in March of 2000. I worked for a pretty large record chain. They were based in Cleveland. But they had, uh, they were in Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Detroit. And the last position I had, I was actually working through uh, all three states. So I was in uh, all three states every week. I was driving back and forth and I kind of worked myself out of my position. And so lost, the, they, they laid me off and I sat on my couch for two weeks, sucking my thumb, like, how am I going to pay my mortgage? Yeah. So, you know, for me, when you're sad, retail therapy. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to a record store, not one I worked at, and in this bin of dollar CDs, and this is like, you know, March, April, 2000. And I'm like, these CDs have to be worth more than a dollar. So I cherry picked 20, I threw, threw down 20 bucks, cherry picked 20 of them out of there and went home and taught myself how to sell online. And it worked right away and I was hooked. And within three months, I was selling about 350 to 400 CDs a month, not wow. dollars, actual CDs. And so I got to the point where, you know, and don't forget, this is pre-print labels. This was still, you had a lick stamps. That's how long ago this was. And so I'd go up to the counter and there was a point where the counter guy goes, we can't do this every day. I go, do what? He goes, you have too many packages. I go, "Oh, geez. that's your job. What is my options? He goes, you can put stamps on at home on yourself and just drop them. I go, oh, I'd rather do that. I don't want to wait in line. I hate waiting in line. Yeah. So he, he told me how much to put on. And then if it was an extra ounce, put on this and put on that. And, uh, uh, but yeah, the first like three, four months, I had to lick them. And then, and then self-adhesive stamps were invented. I'm like, oh, phew. But yeah, I just did my own stamps. It was so much quicker. And, you know, from that point, and, and I shipped internationally right away. So I taught myself from mm -hmm. get-go, customers all over the world needed my stuff. And, and they did. And I'm still shocked. Dude, there are so many people in our circles that won't ship internationally. I'm like, what is wrong with you? Oh, yeah. yeah. You're leaving out 7.3 billion potential customers. What? That's a horrible yeah. business model. Horrible. It's, especially now, uh, eBay uh, has it where you actually ship to a U.S. facility and then they'll handle shipping it out of the U.S. for you. I don't so even do that. Well, I'm just letting people know. that You that can. Actually, it's, you can. It's easier, but I actually, I actually, my shipping is cheaper to the customers and I, make, I still make money off the shipping. Ah, there you go. It's easy. Go. Come, come, I'll teach you. It's easy. <laughs> Speaking of teaching, why don't you tell everybody about this course, this thrifting course you have and uh, how they can get a hold of you and learn more about the thrifting course? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I teach classes in person when we can. <laughs> I'll come to your city, especially if your city has a tiki bar. That's where I base all my classes around. <laughs> uh, and I'll teach a two-day class, one in the thrift store, hands-on. And then one in a classroom setting, you know, showing you how to ship, how to list, how to research, all that stuff. Uh, but I also do uh, web classes online and I got a new one coming up. And when this, when your uh, podcast drops, it's uh, the next day, I think. Uh, okay. So if you go to uh, www.flipping, 
vinylrecords.com. And you actually have to put in the WWs. I know you don't usually have to say that, but on this <laughs> one, you have to put, you have to say, you have to put in the WWW or you end up in some weird website. Right. <laughs> but www.flippingvinylrecords.com. I've done flipping CD classes one and two. I've done cassettes. And now we're up to records because records are so hot. And so it's a free class. It's going to be about an hour long. And it's going to give you the jump start you need if you know nothing about records. Absolutely. Now, you're not going to be an expert. Like I've, get, I've caught a lot of heat online for this class and this class alone. I didn't catch heat for CDs or cassettes. People are angry I'm teaching records. I don't know why. And uh, our mutual friend, John Lawson, who helps me uh, with the back end, like putting the stuff together, he goes, dude, you have angered the vinyl gods. I go, yeah, apparently <laughs> I'm getting yelled at every single day. And, and people are saying like, don't pay this snake oil salesman nothing. I go, it's a uh, free dude. class. You just wrote that under the word for free where I'm having a free class. Well, well they're not going to be experts. No one is an expert at the end of an hour class of anything, but it's a start. Exactly. That's, that's where I like to help people. I like to see people uh, take the knowledge that I teach them. And I do have paid courses too. I'm not lying about that. But the paid courses go so much deeper. If you want to go to that next level, I will absolutely help you to that next level. Uh, but this is a free one. This is a free one to start. If you want to go deeper, we'll go deeper too. But this is going to get your feet wet. Yeah. What to look for, where to find it, how to research it, how to sell it. And the most important thing, especially with records, how to ship it. <laughs> because oh, let me tell you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's important. Record, shipping a record is not for the faint at heart. Uh, shipping a CD is pretty easy. You throw in a number zero pad of mailer and you're good. Yep. Records got some more, uh, more to it, especially if you have a record that opens. It's called a gatefold. So these are the things that we're going to discuss. And uh, you're going to have to go, go to flippingvinylrecords.com to be able to hear about how to ship those correctly. I'm going to make this really simple. If you're on the podcast, I'll try to put in the notes all the links. But if not, or for some reason you don't have anywhere to write this down, Jason T. Smith. T probably stands for thrifting. So Jason <laughs> Thrifts. JasonThrifts.com is another website. Yep. If you're watching this on YouTube, all the links will definitely be down in the description. Before we go, one last question. I noticed you got a Spice Girl. Is that, is that a CD? What is that? He's that got some. For, that is for your photos, old school. Photos, photos, a little memorabilia with your photos. Now, rumor has it you're a giant Spice Girl fan. No, uh, I don't. I don't really like the Spice Girls all that. As much. he pulls out, so everybody it, on the podcast, he, he's pulling out. Yes, all I, this memorabilia that's Spice Girl just happens to be on my desk. <laughs> uh, you know, and here's how I felt. Here's how I fell in love with the Spice Girls because when people come visit my house. And they see my Spice Girls collection. They go, oh, you weren't kidding? I go, that's a, not a funny joke, <laughs> especially in 2000 and 2020. Um, when Spice Girls first came out and their big hit wannabe was, it was number one in 40 countries. And I hadn't heard it yet. And I'm always curious about a song that crosses uh, uh, into different languages because it's, sure. it's in English. And I'm like, I got to hear this song that it doesn't matter what language you speak, people love it. It's kind of like BTS nowadays. All these young kids are singing songs in Korean. They don't know what they're singing, yeah. but it crossed all these boundaries. So I'm working at a record store. I put the album of the CD on and the wrong thing to do is complain to the boss about his pick because it went from, I want to hear one song to, well, we're gonna listen to the whole CD on repeat now because you complained. And I fell in love with them. I, I love I love a lot of music, but I'll, I really love shitty pop music. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to swear. <laughs> I love crappy, I love crappy pop music. And Spice Girls are right up there. I love them dearly. Uh, but I became uh, a collector because I'm very much a collector of all things. And uh, uh, I fell in love with them. The last tour, I followed them around like the Deadheads follow the Grateful Dead around. So I was, I was on tour with the Spice Girls for a week around the country. Uh, but, but I love collecting their stuff. And all my thrifter friends know that. So one of the best things I have was because a thrifter found it for 10 bucks and he posted it in a different group, not my Facebook group. And a friend of mine who was in my Facebook group and that Facebook group said, um, I have the person who's going to buy this from you. Let me just link you directly up with them. <laughs> it was a platinum award for sales of their two major albums. Wow. Give it to a DJ. And so it's the two albums and all the platinum CDs and, yeah. and the platinum record. I'm like, yes, please. So they found it at a garage sale for $10. Oh. And I sent them a hundred bucks plus the shipping. 
And it's like the focal point of my collection now. So that's awesome. Don't judge a book by its cover. You never <laughs> look at me and go, big Spice Girls fan. Yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. If ever, if you get to see Jason, uh, hopefully I'll get to see him at person at some point here when I'm out in Vegas. Uh, we had a few things planned actually to meet and they kind of fell through. But when COVID's over and I'm out in Vegas, I'm going to awesome. definitely uh, take Jason out to dinner. My treat. And everybody who's listening, uh, Jason T. Smith, a.k.a. Jason Thrist, thanks so much for being on the Ecom Wiz podcast. Last question, one answer, favorite Spice Girl. Oh, that's like saying, who's your favorite kid? I only uh, get and, one, you only get one name. Yep, yeah, yeah, and I like them all for different reasons, but it is uh, Ginger has always had my heart. There we go. <laughs> Jason T. Smith, thanks, go, thanks for go look him up. This is a blast, man. Thank uh, you. No problem at all. So jasonthrifts.com and flippingvinylrecords.com. Go take a look, everybody. Appreciate you all uh, listening in. Thanks. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more information, please visit feedbackwiz.com.